Good morning and welcome to GDOT's recovery process training. My name is Christina Schmidt and I'm with GDOT Support Services, assisting the Office of Environmental Services. Uh, before we get into today's topics and presenters, I want to go over some general housekeeping. If you've joined one of these sessions before, you're probably pretty familiar with these. Uh, first, if you happen to join anonymously via the web and not through your desktop app, please take a minute and type your name and email into the Q&A box so, th so that you'll show up in the engagement report. And as always, microphones are muted but we do very much welcome your questions and comments, which you can type into the Q&A box. And please feel free to type questions in at any time. However, we will be fielding all questions at the end of the presentation. And lastly, this session is being recorded and it will be posted on GDOT's recent training sessions uh, webpage, and we can put a link to that in the announcements. Um, the live um, video will be posted there along with the PowerPoint slides and any of the Q&As. So uh, joining me today uh, from OES are Amber Phillips, Assistant State Environmental Administrator, Amber Maddox, Environmental Delivery Support Team Manager, and Liza Weigand, Environmental Delivery Support Team Scheduler for Districts 1, 2, and 4. Uh, the topics that we'll be going over today will begin with a little introduction and discussion of the recovery process implementation. We'll go over the need and purpose for the recovery process. We'll talk about, give you a big picture overview of the workflow and how to prepare for a recovery plan meeting. We'll do a walkthrough of the recovery schedule form um, and uh, work through sort of an example project to, so, to show you what it might be like in real time. And then uh, we'll talk about how that recovery plan will be tracked and wrap up with some takeaway messages. And then lastly, we'll get to any of the questions. After today's training session, uh, you should be able to understand the overall process for developing a recovery plan know the roles and responsibilities for conducting a recovery plan meeting, know how to prepare for a recovery plan meeting and what to expect at that meeting, and lastly, where the project team can find the recovery plan once it's been developed. And with that, I'll hand it over to Amber Phillips to do a little bit of uh, background and talk about implementation timeline. Thank you, Christina. So. As you all know, we have schedules in P6 that we need to follow, but sometimes we get a little bit off track with those schedules. And it, it's a lot harder for us to see what a recovery plan looks like. Sometimes something may be saved in project wise, but most of the time it is not. And so we started to brainstorm, how can we get the whole team on the same page? Because once you're in a recovery, schedule, those dates become even more important and there's less time for recovery. And if you're not really tracking those closely, then what happens is a project gets further and further behind schedule. So the schedulers really did a great job for us, um, Amanda, Christina and Liza, to help come up with this plan they're about to present to you guys. And the idea will be that we're coming together and telling you guys when at least from an environmental perspective, that we feel like a recovery plan really is needed. And that, as they'll show you, will really be if we cannot get on track by a, the next P6 milestone, that would be what we would consider a major milestone. And we'll be able to do this recovery initiative. With that, I'll turn it back over to Christina. Thanks, Amber. Um, and I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into kind of the need and purpose for the recovery um, process. Um, so we, some of the feedback that was received uh, up to now uh, from OES, SMEs, they haven't always necessarily felt engaged in the, in the uh, creation of recovery plans. 
and those recovery plans haven't always been consistently shared or weren't easy for everyone to find. As SMEs mentioned that they have sometimes been asked to expedite deliverables without necessarily knowing what those targets are that they're supposed to be hitting. Um, from OPD PMs, they've requested more di direction and standardization of how and when exactly to create a recovery plan process. And then overall, from a management perspective, um, as, as Amber mentioned, there's not really currently a centralized way to document and track those various recovery plans once they're created. So based on those needs, what the scheduling team attempted to do with this recovery process was to standardize and codify the creation of recovery plans. And we wanted to clearly identify the triggers and the roles and responsibilities, the timelines, et cetera. Um, we also really wanted to focus on promoting collaboration and accountability in the development of recovery plans. So making sure everyone's coming to the table um, and we're capturing all the various different information from the different SMEs. And then we wanted to create a centralized database to house and track recovery plans. Um, and the way that we've done this is through the creation of a Microsoft form and a companion SharePoint list, which we'll be going over today. And then lastly, I think this is kind of a, a really important component is um, this process is really meant to focus on recovery efforts really early on in the project schedule when we have first started to slip and to attempt to get us back on schedule um, when there's time to do so. And with that, I will hand it over to Amber Maddox and she's going to work, uh, go through the workflow and talk about preparation for the recovery plan meeting. Yes, good morning. I will just start by giving a high level overview of what the actual process um, should look like. So the first thing I'll note is that the process is going to be triggered by our OES EPMs, and that'll be in coordination, of course, with SMEs. So it starts with um, the EPMs deciding at resource ID complete whether a project is ready to advance to A3M. So if that project can go to A3M, even if that is at risk, um, or if the project cannot advance to A3M, that'll be the decision made by the EPM. But if it can advance to A3M, um, that project will not fall in the category of needing this overall process. So right now it's only for projects that cannot proceed to A3M. Also, all projects, um, let's see, once the EPM makes that A3M determination, um, they will then send a notification email to the PM, um, and that will either be an email saying, we're good to go to A3M as scheduled, or when, uh, the notification will say, we cannot proceed to A3M, and this a recovery plan meeting is needed. Um, and essentially that email will, pro will provide the PM with all the details needed on next steps for actually scheduling the recovery meeting. Um, there'll also be guidance um, for them to provide to SMEs for preparing for that meeting. Um, and the email will also um, include the information and materials needed for the PM to move forward with the scheduling of that meeting. So also just to note, this recovery plan meeting would ideally take the place of sort of a routine project team meeting, um, and that's of course where feasible. So once the meeting is actually scheduled, this is when SME preparation um, comes into play. So just to note, in order for this process to work and sort of be meaningful, um, SMEs will need to take a bit of time to prepare for the meeting. And we'll talk a bit more about that in detail here in just a second. So once we get to the actual meeting, at the meeting, the PM will just use the digital form to guide the project team through um, the series of questions that are meant to sort of develop the recovery plan. Um, and Liza, Liza will talk a bit more about the form um, to be used at the meeting, but essentially that form, it just poses questions that are meant to foster thought and conversation just for the development of sort of like Amber was talking about a realistic recovery plan that the entire team can really all agree upon. And then sort of at the end of the meeting um, and once the form is completed, the PM will simply click submit at the end of that form and um, the recovery plan will auto generate an entry into the SharePoint recovery plan tracking list. 
Now, just to note, to make any changes to this, you'll need to coordinate with an OES scheduler. So um, you can't, anyone can't just go into that SharePoint entry and make changes. You'll need to coordinate with an OES scheduler to make changes on that. Next slide, Christina. So just to talk a little bit about projects that could require a recovery plan, at the moment, this effort is really only intended for projects leading up to right of way. So that will be both state and federally funded projects leading up to right of way. Those projects will be evaluated for the potential need um, for this plan. Um, the effort is also not intended to be used on any projects that have already passed the point of resource ID complete. So basically only new projects are being considered for this effort. Um, and then also we did pull just a little bit of data to give a quick snapshot of the amount of projects that could potentially be evaluated for use um, for this effort. Um, and as you can see, I pulled the data for three months, that's just May through July. And for all three of those months, a single PM could have anywhere from zero to two projects that need to undergo this process. And also to note, this data does not account for projects that can proceed to A3M as scheduled. So the projects that are on time would, um, would not be evaluated, of course. So ultimately, the average number of projects would even would, could likely be even lower than the zero to two number. Next slide, Christina. And just to talk a little bit more about preparing for the recovery plan meeting, um, like I mentioned before, once you get the invite for the for the meeting, you will you will get a link to the recovery plan section of the OES SharePoint site. And you can see those here. Um, this first image is sort of the landing page and then you would just click recovery plans and it would take you to the recovery plan resources section. And then in this section, you will find a checklist and that checklist is broken down by staff person. Um, so PM, SME, designer, and then further section off to give guidance for how to prepare for the meeting, um, what you can expect during the meeting, and even steps to take after the meeting. Um, so you'll also find on that SharePoint page an Excel form, and you can see those images here. This image on the left is the um, checklist. As you can see, it's broken down by PM, environmental SME, and designer, and then further broken down by before, during, and after the meeting. And then this image on the right is the Excel form. Um, and with this form, it gives the exact questions in the, the digital form that will be used at the meeting. Um, and it's also set up so that SMEs can manipulate the form to view sort of only the questions relevant to them. That way it's a little bit more not digestible. Um, and this will give SMEs a heads up as to what type of information they will be expected to know. So in general, you sort of want to think about um, the current status and forecast dates for key deliverables and milestones. And then you also want to go ahead and just think through ways that you might be able to expedite these items um, and any potential uh, schedule risk. You know, there may be something specific to archaeology or history that the group needs to know about and that might impact the schedule. So that too will be need to will need to be noted at the meeting. And just these two images, we have the, the checklist and the Excel form. Just one last note to point out, these are really the main items that are going to assist with your preparation for the meeting. Um, so if you take time to sort of reference, the, reference these items prior to the meeting, um, the process will be efficient and hopefully work as it was intended to. So I'll pass it off now to Liza to talk just a little bit more about the actual digital form that will be used at the meeting. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, um, so the recovery plan form was developed, um, as Christina has said earlier, uh, using Microsoft Forms, the Microsoft Forms application. And the questions have been divided into four sections. Uh, the first section is general project information, followed by environmental resource ID, and then a section for preliminary design and technical studies. And then the fourth section is for uh, public involvement, environmental approval, and right away certification. Um, you'll notice as we take a look at um, the actual form questions that at the beginning of each question, uh, the individual responsible for the response is clearly identified. 
Uh, however, during the meeting, the actual form entry should be made um, and entered by either the PM or another designated representative. You'll also notice that additional information um, and direction for each question is provided as needed uh, just for clarification for what um, information is needed for that response. And you'll notice too that there are a lot of questions in the form. However, a couple things to note. Uh, the questions were developed to ensure that important details weren't overlooked. There's branching logic that's actually built in um, to the Microsoft Forms application. So depending upon your response, um, it may limit the number um, of questions that you are required to uh, respond to. And then each uh, subject matter only needs to respond to a small subset of the overall total. And um, the more team members can prepare, uh, before the meeting, the faster the completion of the form will actually go. Um, so for most projects, we expect it to take about 45 minutes to an hour to complete. Um, but of course, um, since this is a new process, initially it might take folks a little bit longer. And then if it's a, a much more complex project, it might take a little bit more time as well. So preparation is definitely key. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the navigation of the form. Um, you wanna make sure that you use the, at the bottom of the form screen, you'll see that there's a, a, a back and next option um, of buttons there. Uh, you wanna make sure you, use, you utilize those buttons as opposed to um, the back button at the top of the window or in the browser um, because if you use the those other back arrows it will actually reset the form and you'll have to start over so you want to use those buttons down at the the bottom of each screen um, so that you can save your entries as you move forward um, so those entries are available um, to edit as if you use the buttons at the bottom, um, but they aren't actually recorded anywhere until you click on submit. So um, just be aware of that as you make your way through the form. Next slide, please. So this is an example project, um, just hypothetical project um, that we use to kind of illustrate how you would uh, complete the form. This is not um, an example of all of the questions that you, that are possible to have in the form. Those, of course, would be available in that uh, Microsoft Excel um, file that Amber mentioned just previously, uh, which lists all the questions. So again, that branching logic is built in. So depending upon how you respond um, to the question will determine the next uh, following question and the next series of questions. So you'll see this is that first section of questions. Uh, for the general project information. So it covers, um, you know, the date of the meeting, the PI number, the district, um, the county, uh, the reasons for why the project is behind schedule um, and why we need to have the recovery plan in place. Um, and then it also walks you through kind of what the initial targets are for uh, recovering the project. So if it's state funded, it would be, um, it could be that technical studies completion date. If it's federally funded, um, it could be that right of way certification date. Um, and then the other options are the um, management right of way authorization date um, or to capture the, the fiscal year for right of way authorization. So this is where that discussion begins at the, in the meeting uh, with the team as to kind of what that initial recovery point um, should be. Again, this is something that as you make your way through the meeting, through the discussion and, com and the completion of the form, um, that might be, uh, that could potentially be revised depending upon how um, that discussion goes. So um, keep that in mind, but this is kind of a starting point for, for the discussion of um, how to recover the schedule. So next slide, please. So this starts the environmental resource identification um, section of questions. It's uh, got a section of questions for each, um, essentially for each environmental SME. Um, there are some questions for um, the project manager and the design team kind of in, um, interspersed throughout the whole form. Um, 
And then you'll notice too that the questions for the environmental SMEs um, are very similar to one another. So the questions for ecology look very similar to the questions for archaeology and history. Um, so, but the, the answers may not be the same just because the questions are, are similar. But um, that's just for consistency so that it, uh, that it makes more sense as you're moving through the form as to what the expectation is for the responses. And again, you'll notice that under each question um, in italics, there's additional information just to kind of clarify um, things to consider uh, when you're providing a response to that question. And then again, you want to use that um, next button to move on to the next screen, or you'll use the back button if you need to go back and correct something. So next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then this section is the uh, preliminary design and technical studies uh, portion of the form. Um, so this is where we're kind of uh, getting into when those plans will be provided. Um, and then again, each of the environmental SMEs are asked about their particular um, section and deliverables. And each of those sets of questions look very similar for each of the sections of environmental. Um, but as you make your way through this, you'll see that um, it becomes more and more clear kind of what the critical path is um, for um, for, well, previously what the critical path would be for resource ID, what the critical path is for technical studies. Um, and then that helps you kind of uh, zero in on um, what needs to be the focus and what needs to be uh, kind of tracked closely in order for the recovery plan uh, to be successful. And also to note, um, as we as you make your way through the form in the meeting, um, you'll want to make a note of those important dates. It just makes it easier to kind of track through since there are um, quite a few questions um, rather than having to go back um, several times to reference. It's just helpful to have somebody kind of jot those down as you're making your way through the form. Next slide, please. And then this is a continuation of the preliminary plans and technical studies. Um, so you'll just see additional information as to, um, again, each of the um, each of the SMEs uh, sections of questions to respond to, um, and for the the PM and design to also uh, provide information to shape that recovery plan. Next slide, please. And then this is the the last uh, couple questions for the preliminary plans and technical studies portion and then starting the questions concerning public involvement, environmental approval and right of way certification. Um, so it kind of walks you through what's needed um, for those uh, additional steps and then um, to ultimately get to that right of way certification and right of way authorization. So that is taking it. We're kind of walking you to that um, selected uh, recovery point that was discussed early on at the beginning of the project at the beginning of the form. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. And then um, this is the last of the questions. Um, and then it, this is a point in the meeting where you have an opportunity for the team to review all of uh, the responses. Um, one, to make sure they're accurate, two, to make sure that, that um, they make sense, that they're uh, realistic and they're achievable targets, um, that everyone is in agreement as to the level of effort that needs to be done um, for each uh, portion of the recovery plan, and that the selected recovery point makes sense for the project and that um, it's something that is achievable and that it's not um, an exceptional uh, lift for any one particular person and that everyone's kind of um, working together to achieve this recovery plan. Uh, so with that, um, Christina, I'll hand it over to you and she will talk about the uh, what happens once the form is submitted. Um, and again, you need to use the submit button. Um, you can go back to make those edits, but uh, once you hit that submit button um, and the form is complete uh, and those responses have been submitted, um, she will show you what happens with that information from there. Thanks, Liza. Um, actually, I might just go back. I saw a question came in about um, the number of questions maybe each SME has. So I just want to touch on something real 
quickly before I move on to the, if I can get the slides to the back. Um, so like Liza said, these are kind of broken out into those kind of major schedule phases like the environmental resource ID and the technical studies and the environmental document. And within each of those sections, um, there are certain SMEs that will need to respond. So for the environmental resource ID, it's really targeting that archaeology, history, and ecology um, SME information. And each one of those will need to be able to kind of um, identify when they expect sort of survey to be complete, um, when they expect to receive their um, uh, report for review, and when they anticipate that report being finalized, either if that's internally or uh, with agency concurrence. So every, um, so archaeology, history, and ecology will need to answer all of those individual questions along with any sort of risks or documentation of how they might expedite those parts of the schedule. Um, and the reason um, why the history appeared like it might not have as many questions compared to the archaeology and ecology was in this particular example, we indicated that history was complete for that project. And so in that case, um, those questions sort of went away, like Liza mentioned with that branching logic. So there were fewer questions for history for the resource ID uh, than there were for archaeology and ecology. Um, and then, then if you go back into um, technical studies, those questions are very much the same. You know, when do you expect the report to be completed and submitted for review? When do you expect that report to be finalized? And are there any kind of risks that you're aware of? And in this uh, portion of the schedule, it will be for archaeology, history, ecology, air and noise. So we kind of add those additional SMEs into the mix. Um, and then everything's pretty similar for public involvement plans and for the environmental document. It's all about knowing when do you expect those reports to be submitted either to the manager or for review, um, and when do you expect the agency concurrences for everything. So once you've uh, finalized that um, recovery plan form and you've hit submit, that form is going to automatically transfer all that information that was captured during the meeting to a SharePoint list, which you're seeing here on the right side of the page. And so that's gonna be the way that we're gonna capture all of that data into a database that we can then kind of go back and look at and track, et cetera. Um, and once that um, SharePoint list entry is created from the form, the scheduling team will be notified and they'll see that there's been an entry added. And from there, they will uh, take that entry and they will uh, send an email to the project team to let them know that the recovery plan has been posted. They'll get a copy of that recovery plan. Um, this is a part of the process. We're still kind of finalizing um, how to create this sort of more digestible version of the recovery plan. I'm, I'm showing you a screenshot in the middle with the, the colored bars. That's um, what we're working on to develop to make sure that it it's a little bit more digestible than just a standard SharePoint list with a bunch of columns. Um, the recovery team or the project team will also receive a link to that recovery um, plan, like a permanent link that they'll be able to go to whenever they need to. Um, and the way it kind of works is when you click on the, the number for the recovery plan, that's when you see this um, kind of formatted view of what it looks like. And as Liza, I think mentioned, or, or Amber Maddox mentioned, um, only the scheduling team will be able to edit or modify that recovery plan and any of the entries. So once you get that email after the meeting and you have a chance to kind of review your components, um, that's a good time if you see something that's an error or needs to be modified to email the project team uh, or email the scheduling team and let them know that you need to make some changes. And then also um, you will be able to navigate to that recovery plan from the recovery plan resources web page we showed earlier, which you can get to from the OES SharePoint. So you can get to it that way as well. 
Uh, and we're we're moving along pretty fast here, so maybe you won't take up all of your morning, but just, this is just to give you some kind of high level takeaways. Uh, and then we can see if there are any questions that folks have. Um, so again, this only applies to projects that are not able to proceed to A3M. So the EPMs will be making that decision and notifying the PMs of whether their project can advance to A3M or whether it needs a recovery plan. And again, this is, this is important. We're trying to get an earlier touch point for evaluating recovery and hopefully ensure that more projects are getting back on schedule. Lastly, that preparation is really going to be super important for expediting your recovery plan meeting. The more people can prepare and track down that information, what's the status of my survey? What's the status of the report? You know, what kind of uh, agency concurrence am I going to need? Let me think through how much time all of that's going to take. Um, collaboration is really the kind of key element of this. We really want to make sure that everyone's being invited to the table to talk about their um, particular area of expertise and making sure that we're recording any uh, risks that might um, be part of the schedule that we need to be aware of. And then lastly, uh, we're creating a centralized place to find and track these recovery plans so that everybody's on the same page. And I think we understand that uh, the recovery plan process is extremely complicated. You saw how many questions were in that form. Uh, there's a lot of um, things to, to go over in a recovery plan meeting, a lot of things to consider. And this is going to be a new process, so we understand there's going to be some growing pains. So we really welcome any comments and feedback anybody has so that we can kind of ensure that this is working as best it can and it's helping people out and not just adding to their workloads. So there's all of our contact information there. So please email us early and often. And then uh, <laughs> if anybody has any questions, we can take those now. Okay. There are a couple questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'll okay. go ahead and publish um, this one. It's saying, um, so will the, the form generate additional questions if resource ID isn't done? Um, I'll let Liza speak a little bit to the branching and how that works. So um, as Christina was saying about um, the questions that are involved, um, it's more about uh, the questions focused on the deliverables. Um, and when those are expected and when the um, full approvals and concurrences will be completed, um, particularly uh, like speaking to the environmental SMEs. So if resource ID isn't completed um, for any particular section of uh, environmental, yes, the branching logic will then take you, walk you through um, a series of questions to find out um, uh, basically what's, um, where we are in the process. So um, it'll ask if the report's been submitted, when it's expected to be submitted, um, when the um, the report is expected to be approved and have all full concurrences on it. So you have to consider review times there. And then it asks if um, there's any, uh, any, if there will be any efforts to expedite um, so you can add some additional notes there. So for instance, if there's some field work that's still outstanding, you can put that into um, that box to say why that might be a reason um, why it could or could not be expedited. Um, or if the field work maybe could be expedited, that would be um, another option. And then um, it takes you through uh, the another question regarding schedule risks. So if there's a particularly tricky environmental resource um, or if there's um, particularly uh, a, a particularly challenging situation, um, even outside of environmental, that same question regarding risks um, is provided 
uh, for each of the other sections. So for design and the project manager and public involvement, et cetera. So the questions are very similar kind of for everyone um, because it's all of these things that everyone needs to consider. So um, when things are expected to be delivered and approved um, to have final approval and concurrences, um, again, when um, if anything can be expedited, if there's any particular risks, um, those questions are consistent throughout the entire form. So uh, long answer, but yes, if resource ID is still outstanding, um, you will be walked through a series of additional questions to um, to understand the level of effort and how much time is required for that to be that section to be completely uh, to be completed for resource ID. Um, there's another question asking, can the form be printed off with the answers once it has been completed? Um, and Lennon Nesbitt actually has helped us a lot with this effort. Um, and he has let me know that responses can be sent via email for the end user. Um, so I can get with you on that, Randy, if you, you know, if you want responses. I don't think the form can be printed, but you can get re resp the responses via email and even I think Teams chat. And Additionally, with the the form, all the answers that you provide in that form are copied over to that SharePoint entry, and that SharePoint entry will have the same exact data. Um, I still need to work. We still need to work with IT on a printer friendly version of it. Um, right now, it's formatted, but um, I need I need some additional IT experience in terms of how to get it to print to a printer friendly PDF. But that is the goal is that you would get a copy as a PDF of all those entries that were made during the meeting. OK, so I'll read off just a couple more for you guys. Um, someone is saying that they understand about not hitting the back arrow on the browser or the form will reset. Um, is there a way to save the form as you enter the information? Unfortunately, not. No, that's not a functionality of the Microsoft Forms. Um, you would not you would not be able to complete part of it and then leave and come back unless you still had that browser open. Um, so you do really the intention here is that you really do need to work through this in one particular meeting and make all those entries and then hit submit. Can consultant PMs access the SharePoint site and view the recovery schedule and read only? Yes, that's um, the expectation. We are still working with um, IT to ensure that you would have access to that SharePoint list. Currently, that's a, a newer version of SharePoint. It's a cloud based version and we are working to ensure that anybody that would have access to the the main OES SharePoint site, we're transferring those permissions over to the SharePoint list as well. So when you navigate to it, if you have permission for the main OES SharePoint site, you would have permission for the SharePoint list. Essentially, anybody who has a G dot email address would be able to access it to view. Awesome. So this meeting is requested as soon as we know A3M will, will be missed or as we get closer to that A3M date. I can take this to um, basically um, as Amber when Amber Maddox went over in that workflow process. Uh, this is the identification of whether or not A3M can be held or whether a recovery plan meeting is needed will be made around the time when resource ID would be complete, which is in advance of the actual A3M meeting um, by several months. So it will be happening around resource identification complete. That's where that decision will be made. It will be made by the EPMs. They'll evaluate where the project is in terms of resource ID. They will specifically notify the PM. Your project is complete. You can go to resource ID or we have something outstanding, but it's a low or medium risk. You can still go to um, a 3M meeting or you know this is too far behind and you need to schedule that recovery plan meeting so that will be clearly laid out to the pm it will come from oes 
So someone asks, are there any numbers on how many projects need recovery at A3M or afterwards, such as during preliminary plan development or right of way delays or final plan development? Just curious if there, this will capture recovery for most projects or a portion. So right now this effort is only intended for projects leading up to right of way. Um, and we, so we pulled the data just to see potentially how many projects could possibly need this effort. Um, and it was a pretty small number. Like I mentioned before, it was zero to two per PM in a given month, but we have not pulled any numbers on, you know, delays for after right of way or, you know, our final plans and things like that. Does the recovery schedule inform if a project will end up needing a PCRF? Good question. That is a good question. I have <laughs> not uh, evaluated that yet. Um, but I, yes, I guess uh, it could. That that is part of the process potentially, um, wherein you might get to the end of your recovery plan meeting, or even during the recovery plan meeting, um, the SMEs may bring up information that indicates the project is so far behind schedule that then the the PM could evaluate whether it makes sense uh, for his or her project to proceed to a PCRF instead of a recovery schedule. The intention of the recovery plan process is that you are able to kind of make up that time. You know, you might be a few months behind and um, it, with enough effort, you could kind of make up that time. However, if the SMEs provide information that indicates the project is six plus, you know, nine months off schedule, then I think that's where the PM would step in and, and evaluate that and talk to their program manager and, and determine whether a PCRF might not be the better course of op, um, the better course to take. And it's important to note that um, the recovery plan meeting is still very beneficial if it's determined um, even at the end of it that a PCRF is much more likely than um, the success of a recovery plan um, because at that point, the project team has already provided a lot of information as to what's outstanding and level of effort and um, durations and how much time it's going to take uh, to complete certain tasks. Um, so that should uh, be very helpful when the um, PM needs to put together uh, the, the project change request form package to provide to um, their manager and also to uh, program control. So this is a Chris made a good comment. He says it seems like the SME responses could vary from overly aggressive to not aggressive enough, depending on the person providing the inputs. It might be worth having some sort of manager input or working with OES sections to provide specific guidance to help standardize responses. And you guys can comment on that if, if you'd like. Hey, hey Amber, I'll, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. So in a recovery schedule, there's still, if you're talking about recovering, you're still trying to recover by that right away date. So at the meeting, everyone on the team and the PM should be talking about what their end date goal is that they're trying to recover in the schedule, which in this case would be right away. So when everyone's having that conversation, there's still going to be only a certain amount of time that people can coordinate as a team to recover something. So it's not going to be that easy for people to just be, you know, given a date way out there and be off as much once you start having that conversation, because everyone's going to still have to fit all their activities in a certain timeline. So when you're having that conversation, you'll have to know when you know, when's the design going to finish if they get stuff from environmental on X day? When can we finish there? How can we as a team do things overlapping or can we not? So once you actually start sitting down and having that conversation, you're not really going to be able to be out in left field. The only time that that might occur is if there's something really unique and then it might lead to the right. You might need a PCRF. If you're going to a PCRF conversation, then you're right. It could could come out there that a lot more time is needed, and that is really where timing would be different. But if you're just talking the recovery effort, there's not going to be that much time in the schedule for people to be that far off. I hope that helps answer that. 
there's also in the recovery plan guidance, there's a checklist that Amber Maddox mentioned earlier in the presentation um, that uh, points out the fact that once um, an SME has had a chance to take a look at the questions and um, they're preparing for the meeting, once they've kind of formulated what the options are for their particular section um, and what they can and can't do or, or what might be uh, a more feasible option um, and what might not be an option at all, um, they are instructed in that guidance to take that information to their manager and have that discussion with their manager to make sure um, that they've uh, have vetted this information and that they um, have considered uh, all of the options um, so that when they do come to the meeting, they have all of that information and they have that manager input, even with the manager not maybe not being present at the meeting itself. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think as we go through this process, as people experience it, um, would love to hear everyone's feedback for how they find it in reality. And, and if there are things that we can do to help streamline on the preparation side, that's something we'll keep an eye on. Randy asks, who is in charge of the notes from the meeting, SMEs or PM? Um, I would suggest everyone sort of keeping track of the responses they've provided throughout the meeting. But Christine, if you want to jump in on this one. Really, the form itself should essentially be the meeting minutes for that meeting. Um, obviously, everyone can take their own as well if they feel like they need to. But assuming you are entering everything about the project into the form, it's going to capture all of, of those uh, meeting minutes. Um, the PM is really um, intended to be responsible for entering those or someone they might designate to, to take to make the entries. And so a copy of that will be available when you get the recovery plan after the meeting. Does the form or site time you out if you do not complete the form in a certain time frame? What happens if you made A3M but you are late afterwards? So the well, go ahead, Christina. Sorry. I'm not aware that the form times out. I feel like I've had it personally open for a very long amount of time and it did not time out. So I I would think it would be very long period of time or like you close the browser or something like that. Um, so I'm not aware of that being a, a risk if you're moving through it in a single meeting. Um, and then the other part of the question is what happens I feel like that question is essentially stating that you you've made the recovery plan because it would happen before A3M and then perhaps you've gotten off schedule again. Um, I I mean, I think our response is probably you, it's possible you may need to have another uh, fill out the form again if you're off schedule, but we haven't sort of gotten to that instance yet. So it, we may have it may have to be something that we uh, determine once we get there. So we and have to start somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. And it's important to note too that um, if you've done the recovery plan and you put that together using the form at the meeting um, and then you're you hold A3M and then you're behind schedule again, um, chances are you're kind of working your way into PCRF territory um, because if you were already behind, uh, which caused which triggered the need for the recovery plan, um, and then you're behind again for the recovery plan, um, then you're just further and further behind schedule. And that sort of ties into the next um, comment. The recovery workflow seems to focus on delays at resource ID. Is there another on-ramp into this process if a delay occurs during technical studies, for instance, late NTP on task order two? Um, so for right now, this effort is only intended to focus on delays prior to right of way. We sort of wanted to, you know, get something started, see how it works out and then add on to that, um, you know, if it if we find that this is pretty successful. Yeah, and as as Amber already kind of mentioned, once you get closer to the end of the schedule, there's not really too much time to do a recovery effort. So if something goes off track late, in the process of the schedule, the chances are that that you're not going to be able to recover by the right-of-way date. 
We'll still send escalation letters if we get behind so that the team at a regular team meeting can try to get on the same page. <laughs> Hopefully the timing is so tight to right away that it's something easily for the team to remember where you don't necessarily need to track it if there is a way to get back on schedule. So we're still going to alert people when that occurs so the teams can still talk and try to get to a plan. But again, the later you are in the process, the less time there is to really condense anything. So this effort was really to try to, to get at that as soon as possible to actually have a recovery idea where we get back on right away on schedule instead of a late type of idea. But we can, of course, as we go through this process, if there's if there's a way that might work better for that, then of course we're always looking for improvements or maybe use for this later on. So we can certainly look at that maybe after we've been doing this for a little while, after we see the results. Annie asks, will this also apply to older projects pre-A3M that um, we have to reopen resource ID for? Um, and that the answer to that is going to be, we sort of pull these projects based on their P6 dates. So if a project is reopening resource ID, likely the P6 schedule won't reflect that. So the answer to that, I think, is no. If anyone wants to comment further. Yeah, that should be unlikely um, unless you're having a new schedule put on your project um, and then that new then you're already off schedule for your new schedule. Um, so generally, no, that shouldn't be the case. So with EPM PM being leads on initiating this exercise, would they be responsible um, for making sure that the recovery meeting happens and outcomes of deliverables are achieved? Uh, so that would be a no. They're going to request to the PM. They're going to contact the PM at that point in the schedule that resource ID is supposed to be complete. And as Christina mentioned, that feedback is going to be either we're complete and we can move to A3M or that we're far enough along that you can go ahead and schedule the A3M because environmental is expected to, to recover. So it's going to be like a lower medium risk of going to A3M on time. So if we say that you can go to A3M, that is our recovery plan. That's the recovery effort. If we say, no, we're far, we're so far behind that we need this recovery plan, then that is going to go to the PM and the PM will be responsible for scheduling since they're in charge of scope, schedule, and budget. Yeah, and I would add, I, I think what will be helpful for the PMs is once you've created that recovery plan and you have your next monthly meeting, that's a point to check back in on the recovery plan and pull it up and say, well, these were the dates we were um, expecting to have survey complete, you know, uh, have the reports delivered to OES for their review, et cetera. That's that time to check back in as the PM and to see did we make those um, dates that we projected. Is the consultant or OES SME expected to complete the form and attend the meeting? So if it's a consultant project, then the consultant would have the most information about when things can be complete. So you would, at least if it's a consultant team, someone would need to be there to be able to talk about that plan. We might still have an in-house representative, but the information should come from the person who has the most information about what it's like out in the field, what would happen, how can we condense things, uh, when can I get something turned in, if it's a consultant project, the in-house SME might not have that information. So really just in general, right now, the expectation is that people were already supposed to be having these conversations at team meetings when a project goes off schedule. And I think part of the, the struggle is that all of the, everyone who needed to kind of have that conversation because we all, really can't do anything without each other. So design can't do anything without the environmental information. Environmental can't do anything without 
the next phase of design. And then at the same time, no one can do anything. If they don't know the dates, people can go into the field. So we really just need to all get better and work together. So anyone who needs to attend this meeting in order to get the correct and proper information will need to attend. And to add to that, the um, consultant SME um, should touch base in the preparation. Again, this is in the guidance. Um, the consultant SME should touch base with the GDOT SME to make sure that the options that they've um, uh, developed um, for recovering their portion of the project, um, that they are uh, realistic and that the GDOT SME is in agreement with those because what we don't want um, is for someone to commit maybe to expediting something in particular um, and then someone uh, who's expected to do the expediting isn't part of that conversation. So again, preparation and especially communication is very key in making this whole thing work. Um, the last question we have is, will this help with the pressure we get to go to A3M when we do not even have resource ID? I don't know if Amber wants to speak to this or. Uh, I guess um for this, it's still going to be, I guess, what, what does that mean by we don't have resource ID? The EPM will evaluate, you know, what that particular project's characteristics are. So if we think we're going to have resource ID complete before the A3M date, then most likely we're going to suggest that they can go ahead and schedule the A3M. And if um, there's a need, if it's not going to be able to be complete and it's a high risk, and that will be based on conversations with the SME, then yes, the EPMs would then let the PMs know that this one is high risk and it's off schedule and we need to have that that conversation. So I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah, essentially, as Amber's saying, there's going to be this touch point between um, the environmental program managers and the SMEs. There's going to be an evaluation of where that project is in terms of resource ID being completed and whether it's a low, medium, or high risk, and it's only in those high risk scenarios where you would go to the recovery plan. Um, but there are situations where that EPM in concert with the SMEs may determine that it has a low or medium risk and they will still um, recommend to go to A3M. Okay, um, we currently have no more um, questions <laughs> in the Q&A box. The question jar is empty. Does anybody else have any uh, last minute questions? I did just post an announcement. I think someone asked this earlier and it may have, they may have gotten a private response. Um, the training presentation video, the PowerPoint slides, and all of these questions and answers will ultimately be posted to that um, GDOT recent training sessions website, which I put in the chat. So, You'll be able to review that information and share it with anybody you think may have missed the presentation if they want to watch. And I think the only other question that no one's asked and we haven't touched on is when when you can expect to start seeing these emails making this request. And so we need a little bit more time to finish some some workflows and to make some arrangements. But we think that the first emails will go out starting in the beginning of October. So that I think is the only thing that hasn't been asked that we haven't touched on. These are a lot of really great questions. Some new ones I hadn't even had not heard yet. Um, so really appreciate everybody paying attention and thinking of some really meaningful questions. I know this is a complicated um, topic that we're discussing. Uh, I've been around long enough to have heard other attempts to, you know, how to get at recovery plans and whatnot. So we're trying to get something orga as organized as possible. And uh, ultimately, we're just going to have to test some of these out, you know, with real projects and, and see how this goes. Um, so consider this sort of a, a beta version that we will we will need to update. Um, 
but really appreciate everybody's questions. And if you have others, please, you know, send us an email, reach out. Um, it will only get better if people ask more questions and uh, we can improve it. So thanks everyone for your time. Really appreciate all the other presenters and Brian for producing the live session as always. But I think if that's everything, then uh, you guys can watch this wonderful uh, GIF one more time and uh, have a good day.